William James, Gustav Fechner, Wilhelm Wundt, and Soren Kierkegaard by Woodbridge Riley from Vassar College. Psychological Bulletin, Volume 12, Numbers 1 through 12, 1915. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. General Reviews and Summaries Historical Contributions by Woodbridge Riley, Vassar College. The most important historical contribution since our last general review has been J. Mark Baldwin's History of Psychology, reviewed in the September number of the Bulletin. A briefer supplemental account is given in Kruger's article, which expounds the aims and tendencies in psychology, especially in their German-American relations. Thus, the first laboratory for experimental psychology was established by Wundt, whose first assistant and cooperator was Cattell. For the latter, the claim is made of holding the first special professorship in psychology in the world. While the United States can boast of a more extensive system of psychological instruction than any other country, with particularly valuable investigations in animal and social psychology, the Germans are not particularly conversant with these facts. This German-American account is in turn to be supplemented by the French. So much for the general aspects of psychology. For more particular views, we take up the study of four eminent thinkers, William James, Fechner, Wundt, and Kierkegaard. Knox explains that while James was led on from psychology to philosophy, it was precisely his psychological insight that enabled him to discern the personal sources of the big philosophical antithesis. He was not deterred by the a priori distinctions between logic and psychology, by the assumption that our aim is purely impersonal and objective but held that personal vision and practical makeshifts determined metaphysical theory. He challenged the intellectualist axiom that the parallel lines of knowing and doing must never meet. This makes his principles of psychology as valuable a handbook of ethics as it is of logic. Thus was early laid in psychology the foundations for the coming pragmatism, and so conversely, James invites us to treat our moral and religious aspirations as methodologically on a par with scientific categories. As with James, so with Fechner. Engel points out that in the case of the German, a curious tendency towards a practical mysticism. From the physicist comes forth the philosopher, and the laboratory has given place to the oracle, Believing that the reality of the world must accord with what is reasonable, Fechner saw clearly that this reality could not be deduced by dialectics, but that it must be worked out as one works out final questions in physics, namely by generalization and by analogy. In other words, the purpose of Fechner was an inductive metaphysics, or metaphysik von unten. Now James, who twenty-five years ago gave his official opinion that the proper psychological outcome of Fechner's work was just nothing, has made the amende honorable in a generous sympathetic essay in the pluralistic universe. Moomin's account of the life work of Wilhelm Wundt is noteworthy for two features. Its arraignment of German officialdom for its neglect of a great thinker, and its praise of American psychologists for spreading the fame of the master. The former fact is explained as due to Wundt's South German independence of bureaucracy, the latter as due to his endeavors to make his work both scientific and practical. To Americans brought up on the old introspective mental philosophy, the new experimental psychology was a welcome relief. 
in place of the old static view of the mind came the doctrine of development in place of the study of the normal adult was offered animal and child and race psychology so what fechner had started at leipzig wundt enlarged and america spread james's pragmatism and fechner's mysticism had a similar twofold aspect both were scientific, and both sought truth under the analogy of the self. So was it with the system of Kierkegaard, as his compatriot Hofting shows. The Danish thinker's philosophy had a double quality, being both personal and scientific. While subjectivity is the avenue of truth, the world in which we live is a world of scientific approximation and James's pluralism is matched by the statement that the personal world represents not a world, but a plurality of worlds, resulting from the different points of view of personalities. Here arise four chief types. There is the ascete, who draws a tangent to the circle of life along the line of passing pleasures. There is again the ironist, who, knowing how to distinguish the interior from the exterior, strives to shelter his inner life against the changes of the moment. There is next the moralist, who enters into positive relations with other men and endeavors to fulfill his duty. There is finally the humorist, who being sadly affected by the contrast of finite and infinite is forced to look upon life as more or less of a joke all this reminds one of james's types of thinking from the man who carves out order to him who considers the universe a vast grab bag between the American and the Dane there is, then, final agreement in respect to the doctrine of discontinuity, the old idealistic continuity being supplanted by the view that both the psychic and cosmic life proceed by leaps, natura per saltum. End of William James, Gustav Fechner, Wilhelm Wundt, and Soren Kierkegaard by Woodbridge Riley, Vassar College, 1915.